So Jim suggested that I uh, have a provostial role at AAU, and I think I'm going to use that argument with uh, AAU President Hunter Rawlings, see if I can plug for a raise. But, um, but in fact, I, I've never been a provost, and I've never been a librarian. Uh, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn last night. <coughs> So I'm going to talk about some issues that I have been involved in of provost-librarian collaborations. How do I make this thing go forward? I just turned it off. <laughs> Got it. Um, first, quickly, just a little bit about uh, AAU organization operation. We were founded in 1900 by 14 universities that offered the PhD. That was out of 38 at the time. Um, our initial purpose was to improve and standardize PhD education, which was a mess at that time, widely viewed incorrectly as inferior to uh, European graduate education. Our current membership is 60 U.S. two Canadian universities. These are strong research-intensive universities, 36 public, 26 private. And this relatively small set does have a significant impact on uh, research and education in the U.S. 58% of all federal research funds go to these institutions. 15% of the bachelor's degrees, 45% of the research doctorates. We house 65% of the postdoc positions. 75% of the members of the National Academy of Sciences are from AAU universities. And we have a significant publication and citation, 67% of the total US publications, 19% of the world total and 89% of the U.S. total citations and 35% of the total. Now, I want to talk about two uh, major collaborations involving provosts and librarians. The first uh, started out in 2009, the Scholarly Publishing Roundtable. I suspect some of you have heard about this. It was created by uh, Bart Gordon, uh, congressman from Tennessee, then chairman of the Science and Technology Committee, uh, and he charged this group with developing consensus policies for expanding public access to journal articles arising from federally funded research, not just discussing, but expanding. So there, there was a, a pretty activist uh, charge. And put together, the committee put together a, a group of key stakeholders, librarians, publishers, university administrators, and Bart did this because he was getting hammered from both directions. Uh, on one day, a group of librarians, public interest group folks would come in and say, you have got to get the federal government to take all of this taxpayer-funded research and get it back to the public for free. And the next day, publishers would come in and say, if you do that, you will hurdle us back into the dark ages, we'll end scholarly communication, it'll be disastrous. So here's the group that put together uh, the provosts, uh, Dave Campbell, Boston, Richard McCarty, Jim O'Donnell, then provost at Georgetown, who, as he just pointed out, was then later promoted to the faculty. Uh, I was made chair. I think they thought I could be neutral by virtue of my ignorance of the issues. Um, Paul Caron, Ann Okris, and Scott Pluchek were the librarians. And we had both uh, for-profit and not-for-profit publishers and this was a really good group that worked hard for the better part of a year. We were helped ably by Fred Davis, Don King, Carol Tenepere. We produced a report, I think, that was really quite good, very thoughtful. Uh, it had a, we identified a number of key principles that had to remain in any kind of scholarly communication business model that would emerge. Uh, we had a number of recommendations, but the core recommendation was that each federal agency should expeditiously but carefully develop and implement an explicit public access policy that brings about free public access to the results of the research that it funds as soon as possible after those results have been published in a peer-reviewed journal. Now, there's some waffling issues in there. Uh, make it available as soon as possible. But the point is that 12 of the 14 members of this task force said Yes, we do believe that the federal government should make the results of taxpayer-funded research freely available as soon as possible. The two that didn't sign on uh, were illustrative of what I think, and I'll say a little more about this later, is a continuing problem within the scholarly communications community. 
YSG of Elsevier to crudely pair, and I should say, both of these members that didn't sign were really productive, hardworking members. They tried hard. YSG of Elsevier didn't sign on because he thought our recommendations called for too much government intrusion into scholarly publishing. And Mark Patterson of the Public Library of Science didn't sign on because he thought we didn't call for enough public <laughs> government involvement. The, the report didn't seem to have a huge impact, but three years later, last February, John Holdren, the director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy, published a very significant uh, directive on public access that echoed much of the recommendations that were in our uh, report. That memorandum calls for all federal agencies with $100 million or more in, in research funding to make freely available for search, retrieval, analyze peer-reviewed publications and data resulting from federally funded research. The research manuscripts were to be made available using a 12-month embargo period as a guide with agencies able to move that up or down based on the mission of that, of that agency and evidence from disciplinary needs. Significantly, the memorandum was very clear that all the agencies had to uh, consult with external stakeholders and take the results of uh, those views uh, into account in developing their policies. The agencies have submitted plans. Uh, they were due in August, and OMB and OSTP are now reviewing those. They will then go back to the agencies for final implementation. The $100 million threshold uh, of the directive for research funding would obligate 11 federal agencies to participate, but in fact, over 20 agencies have, have chosen to participate in this process. There is a real interest among federal research funding agencies in making the results of the research they fund widely, broadly, freely available. Responses to that directive, there are two major ones. First one is SHARE. This is uh, a university initiative. It's uh, being developed by AAU, ARL, Association of Research Libraries, and APLU, the Association of Public Land Grant Universities. And this brings me to the pain I encounter uh, of acronyms. Notice that we had to capitalize the H in SHARE in order to get this. And I'm gonna say more later about this curse in Washington of acronyms, but there we have it. And what we propose to build is a cross-institutional national network of digital repositories. One of the key features of this is going to be to make it seamless for faculty so that faculty can comply with agency-designated repository requirements using a single common user interface. The share system will deal with the complexities which are sure to arise when we're gonna have over 20 federal agencies that are gonna have a cacophony of competing require, compliance requirements, and we want that to be invisible to the faculty. But another major reason for our doing this is independent of the OSTP policy process, this is consistent with knowledge creation, dissemination, and pre preservation as core missions of a university. The other competing activity is another acronym, CHORUS, Clearinghouse for Open Research of the United States. This is being developed by publishers, and it's a large group of publishers, for-profit and not-for-profit, that estimate that collectively they fund about, or they publish about 90% of the U.S. federally funded research. And their description of their uh, process, or of their, the product that they're producing, a multi-agency, multi-publisher portal and information bridge that identifies, provides access, enhances search capabilities, long-term preservation to journal articles resulting from agency funding. So the question now is what's the relationship between SHARE and uh, CHORUS? Are we going to cooperate or compete? And I think that's not clear. So one of the, look at the, at the differences and similarities between the two. SHARE is at its very early stages. Most of our universities are building or have institutional repositories, but we have a lot of work to do 
to get them robust on their own campuses and interconnected and interoperable. But the final network that we intend to build does promise to make research articles, data, and their associated metadata freely accessible for reuse, text mining, data mining, and machine reading. Chorus, I mean, the Chorus, they've got Crossref, they're building Fundref, they've got uh, Crossmark. The, the publishers have a robust basic structure and capacity in place. And they are telling the group of publishers uh, that make up Chorus, they're telling the federal agencies, they can, they can respond to the basic requirements of the OSTP directive with not a penny spent by the federal government. The publishers already have the capacity to do this. They are telling us, the universities, we can, have, we can meet the compliance re requirements for your author submissions. They're all publishing in, in our journals and we'll take, a, take care of the submissions for you, which is very appealing. But there's a great deal of uncertainty about the terms of use for post-embargo content. What will the system be if the publishers essentially implement this entire structure themselves? What will the use uh, uh, properties be of that post-embargo content? Now, it would be smart if the, the university people involved in SHARE and the publishers involved in CORUS would sit down and talk about ways that they could collaborate. Uh, that would be the pragmatic approach, and we have had uh, one very productive conversation with publishers, hope to have more, but there are emerging a set of legislative battles that I really think may drive this collaboration uh, uh, apart. And we have more acronyms. So FASTER is Fair Access to Science and Technology Research Act. Uh, this is the successor to FERPA, which was the Federal um, Research and Public Access Act. Uh, it has many of the properties of the OSTP memorandum, but its statute, its law, not if passed, not regulation. And as opposed to NIH's PubMed Central, which has a 12-month embargo period, or the OSTP directive, which has 12 months as a guide with agencies able to move up or down, this legislation would cut the embargo period in, in half for maximum. And I think some publishers are quite concerned that that would really jeopardize their uh, uh, subscription business models. The other, th this just came out as a discussion draft this past Tuesday. First, a new acronym, Frontiers in Innovative Research, Science, and Technology. This is a successor to the America Competes Act. And I want you to look at competes, creating opportunities to meaningfully promote excellence in technology, education, and science. I mean, that is one of the most preposterous acronyms I've ever, ever heard. <laughs> you don't need to know that first followed competes, but I just wanted you to experience uh, uh, that acronym yourselves. Uh, this would increase the embargo period to two years with provisions to extend beyond that to six or 12 mo more months going in the opposite direction. So here we have universities, libraries trying to cut the embargo period in half. We have publishers trying to double it. And I fear that what we are doing, these stakeholders in the scholarly communication system are degenerating into operating like the two uh, political parties in our Congress. And that's a very pessimistic uh, uh, projection. I want to close with uh, uh, some comments about what I think is a, a really quite promising uh, set of initiatives. Uh, this is a group, ARL, uh, AAU Task Force on Scholarly Communication, that we put together in 2012. Six provosts, six uh, librarians. We have three vacancies now. Tragically, one of those is Ann Wolpert of uh, MIT, whom many of you know uh, tragically died recently. She is going to be a huge loss to the library community and to higher education. Uh, two provosts left under better terms. Peter Salovey uh, got tired of being provost, so he's now president at Yale. And Kim Wilcox is now the chancellor at UC Riverside. But we will replace these because this task force has a lot of work to do. Uh, it 
decided to focus on three areas, university presses, scholarly journals, institutional repositories. And in presses, the concern is that books are being crowded out of library budgets by journals. Universities are reducing subsidies. Uh, and the capacity for the production of books is jeopardized. So a couple of the things that we've been thinking about is the possibility of consolidating sort of back office digital production capacities across presses. Uh, there are some precedents for this. But I think most substantively, moving from subsidizing presses to subsidizing authors, having universities subsidize uh, faculty members' first books, which are typically the hardest to get published, and these would be um, digital, uh, open access books because we've paid through subsidy for the cost. So one of the most significant things here is that even when faculty can get their book published and they sell 223 copies, you've got a limited dissemination. If that book is published electron electronically and is open access, you've got a massive opportunity for much broader dissemination. So I think it's a very promising initiative. And in scholarly journals, what we hope to do is collaborate with some society publishers to move toward open access publishing of journals via hybrid journals, where you have a traditional tradition subscription model, but the journal will publish a given article uh, open access if the author pays uh, the uh, publishing charges, the APCs. To make this feasible on a large scale, we have to get rid of double dipping because typically what happens now is the, uh, the added revenue through APCs for open access articles is simply added to the subscription revenue uh, and that's not gonna work. It, it isn't a big deal now because the, these journals the number of articles that are published open access is relatively small, but if we do this large scale, we need to figure out a way that as the APC revenue increases, the subscription cost decreases uh, uh, equivalently. We've been working with a very smart um, consultant, Raym Crow, whom I'm sure many of you know, on both the presses and the journals. He's written a couple of thoughtful papers on this. He assures us that uh, doing this declining subscription journal um, uh, revenue with increased APCs is something that we can do feasibly. And finally, what we decided to do was institutional repositories. This was really Ann Wolpert's proposal, both to make the, the repositories more robust on campus and interoperable, interconnect them. She thought early that this would connect with the um, federal agency uh, public access interest but now with the OSTP memo, that initiative is off uh, with SHARE. I want to close with something that was supposed to be what this uh, panel was about. And I recently talked uh, to a provost and a librarian at one of our uh, member universities who work very effectively together. And I asked them separately about what they were looking for from, from each other. The, the provost said he wants a, a librarian who can uh, do, be, be supportive with innovation, innovative activities uh, to expand support, new kinds of support to reduce costs, customer focus to have students and faculty in mind in developing collections and support services. He wanted advice and counsel from his librarian. He wanted that librarian to be a public presence a strong voice on campus in support of teaching and research. And the librarian, whom I asked separately, uh, said she wanted her provost to be a good listener, to value students as well as researchers, saying she had had a lot of experience with provosts that seemed to be focused only on faculty, and wanted a provost who would support efforts in innovation. And I think the match between these two really defines the, the effective relationship that they have. And we are going to need more of that because I think looking to the future in scholarly communication, we need provosts and librarians on campus working with each other as an effective team to bring in other fac administrators, faculty and students in advancing institutional capacity in scholarly communication. The challenges 
and the opportunities to exploit the new capacities in digital communication, the challenges are, are far less technological and much, much more cultural. And we are going to have need for a national collective action within the academy to really make some significant change. And AAU and ARL are about to launch a systematic effort across a large number of universities to have provosts and librarians talking with their faculty about the importance and the value of the kinds of changes that are possible. It is a fact that many faculty operate very well in this current system. The problems with it are invisible to them. That's a, a tribute to the university administrators, but it's also a, a, a problem that we have to overcome. And I think that both for, for universities, for publishers, for government agencies, the policies and practices of all of these sectors, including pricing policies, should reflect the public purposes and public financing of higher education, education and research programs. We should not be seen by government agencies as a convenient victim for unfunded mandates. We shouldn't be seen by publishers as a captive audience for generous amounts of revenue. All participants in this scholarly communication system should see it as part of a largely publicly funded service to society and, a per and a participated in, in that vein. Thank you very much.